Hey, you just tuned in to the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. Okay, we're going to give you a shirt today. We're going to give away another Mind Pump media shirt. These are limited edition, by the way. We don't just keep making these. They're limited edition, and here's why. Because they're amazing, they make people stronger and smarter and sexier. So do you want one? You probably do. Here's how you get one. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Tell us why you love the podcast so much. Doug will go into the comments later, pick the best one, then we'll mail this right to your door. You'll get a brand new shirt, your size. Again, it's this exact one right here. Beautiful, beautiful shirt. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, one more thing before we start this awesome podcast, um, we are running a promotion on two programs and a bundle, okay? So... It's getting warm in a lot of places. I know other places are freezing, but it's going to get warm soon. Summer's coming. You know what that means? You got to look sexy. So why not get a program that helps you burn body fat and build muscle? So here's the two programs that are 50% off. We have MAPS HIT, which is high-intensity interval training done right, not the stupid stuff you see in the gym where the trainer's having people jump around and do crazy stuff. That doesn't make any sense. Ours actually makes a lot of sense. So you got MAPS HIT. We also have MAPS SPLIT, which is an advanced bodybuilder workout program. So if you want to Really build your body, sculpt your body. Map Split is a program for you. And we also have a bikini bundle, which includes multiple programs put together uh, to get you that bikini body. Um, and that's already discounted. Normally, bundles are discounted like 30% off. But right now, if you go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code SPRINGBREAK, you get 50% off all of them. So go check them out and enjoy the show. Awesome. Dude, I got a call from... Uh, my old, my old, my first mentor. I th you guys know Don. I told you guys about Don. Yeah, yeah, of yeah course. we met him. So, uh, did you guys meet Don? Yeah, we went over to his gym one time. Did you? Yeah, oh, man, I went with you. Yeah, that's right, you did. Yeah. So, Don Cardona, a good friend of mine, uh, was my first mentor, was my first general manager. This is when I was a, a trainer, and then I got into the, the management side or whatever. How many years does he have on you? He's a little bit older than you. A little bit. He was the youngest GM. Uh, general manager in in uh, 24 fitness history before, before you, I uh, I broke his record. <laughs> you like that, Don? Uh, no, but he um, he was he's let's see, he's I think he's four years or three years older than me, so not that much, right? Um, but anyway, so he calls me the the other day. So he owned a gym in San Jose for a while, and Don is just the guy is he's one of the best uh, sales managers you'll ever meet. He's just, uh, he's, he's an incredible communicator and he does a very good job. Every gym he's ever run, he crushes and sets records and does the whole thing. Right. But he owned a gym for a while. It got destroyed with COVID. All the regulations killed gyms in the area, especially the smaller gyms that were, you know, owner operated because uh, yeah. they didn't have all the financing that, you know, a big chains did. So we had to shut that down. Things are kicking back into gear. He called me and he's grand opening a UFC gym. Actually, next to where we live, where where I live. Uh, oh, really? They're opening another one around here. A big one, right? A big one in the mall, um, uh, next to Oak Ridge Mall or whatever. I, th I think it's still called Oak Ridge Mall. Uh -huh. But it's funny because I'm talking to Don and those guys. Uh, they the owners know because Masteroff owns UFC gyms. It's run by Adam Sedlak. We had him on, on the on the on yeah. the podcast. But a lot of those other guys, they don't know who they're dealing with. Like Don is Don's a tornado, dude. And I'm laughing as I'm talking to him. Because um, we're talking about what their numbers are and who the people he'll be. Because he's very competitive, who he's going against. Uh -huh. And they have no idea, dude. <laughs> he's that old school manager. He goes in and he's there at 6 a.m. And he doesn't leave until they close the doors. And he just grinds. And I was talking to him on the phone. We're just laughing. I'm like, dude, do they even know what they did by putting you at this gym? I can't wait. <laughs> did, I ever, you know, did, I, did I ever stories. tell you when my buddy Mark came back to 24 after he'd, he'd left after years and like, you know, the new wave or new generation of kids that had came in that were working there? And he got offered. It wasn't the Hollywood Club, but it was down in L.A. And eventually he made his way over to the Hollywood Club. But he actually so and I think this was when Dean had the area down there. Dean offers him a club. He refuses to take a club. He wants to start at the counselor position. Just a sales guy. Yes. So he turns down the opportunity to manage. He's like, nobody knows me here. I'm from Northern California. I don't have the same type of reputation down in LA. You want me to run one of your biggest boxes over here? Let me start off as the grunt. Let me start off as a counselor behind two AGMs. So this, the LA clubs are so big, they'd have two AGMs plus a GM. 
and he wanted to start as a counselor just so he could whoop the shit out of everybody as a counselor. Because you know how it is too. When you're an AGM, you get all the prime leads first. Mm -hmm. So as a counselor, you gotta you gotta Oh, you have to generate your own stuff. Yeah, you have to figure it out before the gym starts hooking you up with all the like the cush leads. And mm -hmm. when you get to the AGM position, then you get kind of the cush leads because you've already proven yourself mm -hmm. to get there. And now you're not and you're the best closer in the gym as so you should get the best leads, right? So he asked to come in as a, a count. So he's like the third man in line to get any sort of leads at that place and just quadruples the top yeah. guy for like the next three months before he gets promoted to AGM and then eventually AGM. What is it about that generation? Because I can name you know five or six guys from that generation of club managers, and we're talking late 90s, early 2000s, that just just – crushed and and I really don't know anybody else that came after hmm. that really could could hold a candle what was it was, it was, it, a, it was, culture. It was a culture the culture was crazy yeah yeah cuz you grew up in a certain culture i mean you grew up in a, in a time when that was the norm yeah um that everybody would kind of it was it was i think it was uh there was a, a very small percentage of you know we call shit butts or losers or whatever that just yeah. could not no handouts yeah that were lazy and they and they just got gobbled up by the rest of those and then that person would be out and then a new person would mm -hmm. come in and so there was a greater percentage of those type of people both men and women that were just killers in sales and so it had just created this culture and it was company wide yeah you know and then the you know when Mastroff was running the place they did things that I just think were really smart. I mean, and you know this, Justin. You were you were a part of the generation where they got rid of the the glass trophies. Remember how pissed you were for months? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you were shut down for like two months after that because yeah, it's like bragging rights. You know, it's like uh, you know, I wanted some recognition for that because it's like you work so hard to get it, and then it's like they took away uh, the Hawaii month and all that kind of stuff, and it's like that's what I had left. Well, oh, it just dude. speaks to how we operate as humans too, right? Like you cared more about this stupid little glass trophy than you know what exactly dollar amount you made every single month or if you totally. got a raise and then they in addition to that they used to back when we were sal and they justin i don't think this existed he was already this was already gone so not only would you get these trophies and stuff we used to meet every month with the entire region and then they would highlight you in front of yeah. everybody the top and then they would yep. also highlight the bottom five yes. so, <laughs> yeah. would, so uh, the you'd be you get it to this meeting there'd be oh, hundreds man, probably that. a thousand close to a thousand hundreds if at least at least a few hundred people if not a thousand people yep. in this massive like you know hotel or whatever we hosted at and then they'd have a projector up there and the top five producers you know, in every category, from sales counselor to trainer to fitness gym, manager, GM, yeah, to whatever. every position, the top five would get highlighted on that projector. They'd walk up, they'd get their trophy handed in front of everybody, and then go sit down. And then the bottom five would I, get highlighted. Wow. <laughs> and so you never dude, wanted to make companies that. companies could not get away with that. Today. Oh, it's dude, crazy no, no. Okay, so so I told this story a long time on the podcast. So mo most people, most listeners, probably never heard this. But the way that Don and I really first became close because. I was a trainer, uh, I, you know, 18, I walk in, become a trainer. Within a few months, I'm the fitness manager. Don comes in as my general manager, and he's another young dude. So I'm 18, he's, I think, 21 at the time, 21, 22. And he was cool, but kind of like, you know, observing, like you do when you're a manager. You walk into a gym, you just, first first couple months, you kind of observe, right? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I talked to him about it. I said, look, I want to become a general manager. He's the guy that talked me into starting as a, you know, in sales or whatever. Um, so I did that and we were still cool and you could see that I performed really well, but we didn't become super close until one thing actually happened. So I was in charge of the weekends and this is what you used to do as a general manager. You would have your, your, your senior sales counselor or your assistant general manager run the weekends and it was their job to perform well on the weekends. Well, back in those days, 24 hour fitness used to have these giveaways. We have these contests and this month <laughs> the contest was, that you you every time you worked out you could fill out an entry form to win this really nice expensive barbecue set and we had it in the middle of the gym this like cool barbecue it was, it was summer right cool ass barbecue set and whatever and every time you work out so the more workouts you do the more to enter entries you get right so it's the weekend and i'm competing not against uh anybody in my club i'm competing against other clubs yeah and back in those days we would talk shit to each other, and the way we did it, this is before internet was connected or whatever, 
we would fax each other our our numbers. So I would fax the other clubs, yeah, yeah. and then they fax me. And then sometimes Looks they like you're trailing off. And then sometimes they would lie. They tell me that they're at less than. And we we play these games with each other, right? Well, I I used to call the other clubs that I compete. So I'm in Hillsdale, mm-hmm. and in those days the top clubs were like Mountain View and, and Sunnyvale were the big the big especially Mountain View. That was a that club would crush. Oh, yeah. So I would call the front desk. And I'd pretend to be calling for their district manager <laughs> to get their number so I could see what they were doing. Well, anyway, it was this big contest, and it was like, let's see whose club does the best over the weekend. And I'm like, I'm going to I'm gonna win this, right? So I get in there at 5 a.m. I blow up all the balloons, do the whole thing, whatever. And I'm getting numbers from their front desk, and it's like the clock is ticking, right? And it's neck and neck. I'm neck and neck with this brand-new big club in Mountain View, and this family walks in. And I do the tour, talk about personal training. And I'm like, we're talking about training, memberships. It's like $3,000 deal. That would have put me over and made me win. Last minute, the dude's like, look, we're just going to think about it. We'll come back. You know, I think we're going to do it. Yeah. We'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> Hold on one second. Hold yeah. on. Wait right here. You cannot leave. Bro, he's in the, I'm, in, I'm using the general manager's office. So he's in the front office. I go and take the barbecue down from the stand or whatever, and I wheel it into the office. And I said, if, if you sign up right now, you'll get this barbecue. He's like, done deal. Yeah. So he signs up. I win the contest. Yeah. Barbecue's gone, right? Oh, he so, went, He left with it. Yes. <laughs> barbecue's gone, right? So the next day, Don comes in, and you know, again, we'd only known each other for like a month, right? Don yeah. comes in. He's like, fuck yeah, dude. Good job. You crushed. I knew you would. You you just, you know, this is Where's so the barbecue? No, yeah. no, listen, listen. It gets, <laughs> it gets better, bro. Yeah, I'm here to pick up the barbecue. It gets better, right? Yeah. He doesn't really notice that the barbecue's gone because, you know, it's like wallpaper. You see it all the time or whatever. So nobody really says anything. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, this is cool or whatever. All right, let's see what happens. Anyway, dude, the guy walks in that I signed up, gave the barbecue to. He walks in through the front door, and I'm like, and I'm in the in the back, and I hear him, and he goes, "Hey, can I talk to the manager?" And I'm sweating. I'm like, "Oh shit! Like, what's <laughs> what's gonna happen right now?" So Don comes up, and he's like, "Hey, you know, how can I help you?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Hey, I got the I I yesterday, I you know I I got the barbecue and I won the membership." And Don's like, "You got the barbecue?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I bought the big membership at the training and." Uh, Sal hooked me up with the barbecue. He goes, but it doesn't work. So there's something wrong with it. I want to see if you guys can fix it. it. Doesn't work. <laughs> so Don <laughs> is like display model. Only. So I didn't. <laughs> yeah, dude, so I didn't know Don very well at the time. So I'm like, oh, this is I'm fired. This oh, I'm gonna be screwed. I remember I'm an 18 year old kid. I don't know what the the limits and the lines are yet. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Don is talking to this guy, and Don has this very serious face, right? And he does whatever. Talks to the guy. Comes back in the back office. Sits down with me and just starts laughing his ass off. And he goes, listen, he goes, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that here. He goes, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I appreciate, he goes, I appreciate but, this. Uh, I, he you're goes, very resourceful. I goes, I would, he goes, I would much rather have to pull you back than have to kick you in the ass and push you. He goes, you're my kind of guy. That was it. After that, me and him became real close. But that <laughs> yeah. That's the way that, and he covered for me when the You know what I, found, I find so like interesting when we talk about the culture that, that was created back then was that you as as a manager, you had uh, you know a basic shift, right? Like the nine to six or nine to five type of shift, um, but nobody followed that, Mm-mm. and yeah. it wasn't told that you had to stay later or you had to come in earlier. It, in fact, we all policed our, each other that way. Like if you found out, if I called a club. And, and, yeah. and one of my peers yep. left like at seven o'clock or six oh, o'clock. You're getting shamed. Oh, you! I'm going to talk so much shit yep. when I see you at the next meeting, yep. and then you're going to punk that person. And the and it was beautiful if you're if you're the guy running this company, right? You built this thing. How amazing is that that you have yeah. got a culture that you've built where these people are are calling each other out for quitting work early every day and it became a thing yeah. on who could get there the earliest and who would stay there Dude, the latest I, there was this one agm in in i think it was potrero hill in san francisco and he was all he was i would hit first i was always first and in second place was far away and then this guy comes in and he's actually starting to get a little close to me and i would do that i would call in and they'd be like oh he went home you know eight o'clock so i actually mailed to the gym a set of pajamas for him <laughs> 
<laughs> I did. And I said, it, you're from Sal. And, and he called, what's this all about? I'm like, well, you leave early. You oh, must be tired. It's night night. It's night night time. But we used to do this yeah. and we used to love it. And we Get used your to- warm s- glass of milk. We yeah. used to say this, the following saying. I know, Adam, you remember this. I used to say, bleed purple. Yeah. Be- and be- back then, the purple the purple was the color yeah, you the wore. the jerseys. Yeah, dude. It was so ugly. And, uh, yeah, like, Fila. Yeah. worked with Fila. Yeah. <laughs> well, before Fila, even, it was just a it was just a polo and it was this purple with yeah. the 24 on it. <laughs> Those were I was those there were good for the time. Nike days. Yeah. So anyway, so I was talking to Don. And I'm like, oh man, they have no idea what they unleashed. Like, uh, I hope all those other managers know that they're going to be chasing a new rabbit. You know, an old guy, but somebody who's good. Well, it was easy for me level. to kind of fit in there because it was like such a sports yeah. kind of a culture, totally, yeah. and I, you know, and I love that. And I, I think that, um, you know, that that's something that I wish more companies would carry that type of a mentality and culture and and care. Like everybody cared about what they were doing in there. And like you said, nobody wanted to leave early. They want to be that guy, that yeah. girl. They didn't want to, you know, leave everybody hanging. And, yeah. and it's just like. I don't know. There's too much individualism and there's too much. And you got to worry about that too. If you're running a massive company and having everybody stay at home now and like, how do you, how do you rally everybody together to have that kind you of can't, passion? You, you can't, you can't have sports culture in no. the workforce anymore. No. You can't have, you, can you, you know what your football coach was like. Could you, and that was like what it was like back then. It was yep. just like it. Yeah. I mean, I've seen plenty of desks flipped over, dudes punch holes in the walls and stuff like that. And just Chew tobacco just flying. Dude, I had another day at the office. I, we had a guy fall asleep in a meeting once and while the, the you know manager's giving a meeting uh, and he falls asleep and the manager goes, shh, to everybody, quiet. <laughs> and he, and we, you know, we were in chairs that have wheels on them and he opens the door and slowly wheels him out the door and then flings him across the workout floor, rolling and the guy wakes up in his chair. Oh. <laughs> and then he closes the door. Where am I? I've seen yeah. I've seen a big muscle head dude that was a counselor for us who wasn't hitting his call targets, right? So they're supposed to call at least like 70 to 100 phone calls every single day. Which is a pain in the ass. Right. It's, it's a lot of calls, by the way. If you never call 100 100 people in a day, it's a lot of people, right? I think that I think they've lowered that bar dramatically today. Yeah, it's inhumane. But, yeah, so <laughs> so I mean that was standard though back then and if you didn't hit that, I'll never forget watching this dude get his fucking phone duct taped to his head. Oh yeah. yeah. He, he <laughs> sat him down, they held him down, they put the phone to his ear and then they they wrapped duct tape around uh-huh. his yeah. around his head. So but that's hey, hazy. But no, but you know what though? We all loved it. I mean the truth is you weren't there unless you didn't oh, want to yeah. be there. And you know, the fitness atmosphere, here's the thing. If you if you demand that from your people, you better deliver as a manager, as a leader. And they did back then. This is why the culture was that way. When they stopped delivering, the whole thing started to fall apart. But fitness is prime for that because people don't work in fitness for money. Nobody goes and goes and work in a gym because they want to make a lot of money. They go work in a gym because they love fitness. Yeah. So the passion is already there. The people really care. And they about want to what be better. That's it. They want. They're they're going in there to to become better. And everybody takes that mentality in their individual job. Like, how can I be better today? And, and a lot of times that means working extra hours. It does. It's just it how does. it goes. That's well, the thing. this is like back to the conversation we had before the podcast started. Justin, you brought up like helicopter parents, mm. and they were talking about that this is something that. Uh, is you know part of what's going on with our our colleges right so when the iGen generation right came up through college it became so competitive for parents to get their kids in, in, into school that they began helicopter parenting very early on trying to get them to do so much stuff mm-hmm. so they could then get qualified so that's part of the reason and then when the kids get to school they say that it's turned into schooling is now turned into like consumerism where mm-hmm. kids now look at school as like hey my parents are paying you know fifty thousand dollars a year. I want this. I want that. They started to expect all these things because I worked so hard my whole life to get into this place. I got in this place. We're paying X amount of dollars. And so the school their system- their parents just paid for them to be there. Right. They and, didn't even earn their way in. Well, and that, and now the, and then the school systems start bowing to that, that, okay, we've got all these kids that are saying that, oh, they don't want this speaker to come. They don't want to hear this. They want to hear, they want, only want to talk about these oh, things. Yeah. And they started to flex to all of them. And that's what kind of started this crazy trend that we're into. You know, yeah. I know that we, when we look at studies uh, or statistics, we look at like things like you know, if, you're, if this is your education, then you're li- you're going to make more money than someone with this kind of education. Or if you go to this kind of school, you're more likely to make this much more money than other people, or whatever. Or college versus no college. What I'd like to see is studies done on attitude, because I bet you that trumps out of everything. I bet you the right attitude, that that can do attitude, the hardworking attitude, the attitude of of, of gratitude. And the attitude of, you know, I'm going to go through this and make it happen. I'm going to try again and try again and try again. I'm going to work my ass off. 
That right there is will guarantee you more than anything else success. Mm-hmm. More than anything else. I don't Either that or it. adversity, right? So well, adversity is what I would say because yes. they, you know they talk about this as the the rise of safetyism, right? That uh-huh. that's what they're trying to coddle. All the all this kid, and that starts with the parents, and then goes into college. It's a double edged sword, right? Because you're the parents have have you know got to the point where they don't want their kids to fail. They want their kids to be always set up for success, and so you, you somewhat kind of like get where they're coming from when they're trying to yeah. you know get them in the best college, the best situation, so they can uh, you know have whatever life uh, better life you know and have all these opportunities that present themselves to them. But they skip over all these steps of failure you can't you have to let your kids fail you have to let them earn their way in life otherwise they never own it for themselves it's it's it, as parents you don't want to see your kids in pain you don't want to see them hurt you don't want to see them you know sad so it's it's natural and instinctive to want to protect them but the reality is the more they fail at when it's okay to fail the less they'll, they'll fail when the consequences are massive do you right? know what the number one thing they attribute this to is the lack of free play hmm because you learn a lot of that in free play, they don't do. you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You learn a lot of a you know, little bit of danger, the boundaries, getting hurt, making mistakes, yeah. you know, getting back up again. It's a rough housing. And we have the decline of free play has declined so rapidly that this is this is what they think the result of that is, is parents not I allowing could, I could totally see that. not allowing their kids to do that. Yeah, you know, it's funny the the other day, so you know, my 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 baby son is just the kid doesn't sleep. I told you guys already he's a vampire or whatever. But anyway, uh, we put him in uh, the car and we figured Figured Milk out. Vampire. We figured out if he goes to sleep while we're driving, then we can get him to sleep for like an hour and a half or two hours. But we got to keep driving. We can't stop, right? In fact, we, if I'm at a stoplight, you guys, are, if you ever see a car pumping its brakes little by little at the stoplight, it's because they have a baby in the car. They, they're trying to keep the baby asleep. Because as soon as the car's still, he wakes up. But anyway, yeah. Jessica and I are just driving around, right? Because she's like, well, we got to keep driving. Let's get him to sleep. So I was like, all right, let's keep doing this. So we're driving around my old neighborhood and whatever, and then we go way near the foothills by where I grew up, and I see like the bike trails and stuff, and I'm like, oh man, I'm like, that's where I used to go with my friends all the time. We ride our bikes, and I'm looking at these trails, and I'm like, that is not safe at all. <laughs> <laughs> Like I used I know. to, we used to go down those things flying. Nobody wore a helmet. I didn't yeah. even own a helmet. Yeah, we did a bunch of crazy shit. But I, you know, you're right, Adam. I mean, you learn boundaries and risks and. You know, in in situations where, you know, as an adult, if you fail and as an adult, the consequences could be massive. Failing as a kid usually results in a scraped knee. Yeah. You know, hurt feelings. Hurt feelings. Yeah. That kind of stuff. As an adult, you know, failing is like, oh shit, I'm in massive debt. My credit score's crap. I got divorced or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, terrible stuff. So it's, it's, you know, failing the little stuff is better than failing at the big stuff. No, totally. You bring up sleep. It was just reminding me. I've been meaning to tell you because I finally did this. You had brought it up before and I hadn't used this with my, my chili pad, the Ula, right? So, I finally got it set up on the new bed and everything. And this one, now I have the actual split where Katrina has control, I have control. And I finally messed with the waking myself up. So those of you that have these already and absolutely love uh, love the Uller, I've, I've like played with it enough that I've got this like down to a science for me. Like I take, I make the bed. So about an hour before I turn on the Uller, I get it down to 60 degrees exactly. I get in and then I set it for uh, about 45 minutes before my alarm would go off. And it and, starts to warm up. And I warm it up to like 80 degrees. Mm-hmm. And it is the most amazing way. Isn't to, it weird? Oh, yeah. The house is all cold and stuff. I keep the house a nice low temperature. The bed's cold when I first get in. And then it keeps me that way all night long. And then about 45 minutes. And originally I did it like I thought maybe uh, like it would be like 10 minutes before. That's not enough time. Like I thought 10 or 15. It's I thought enough 30. time for the sun to rise type of deal. You need, yeah, you need four to about 45 mm-hmm. minutes of the sheets heating up to get to like kind of that peak temperature and then to wake you up and you wake up naturally oh yeah the only feature it's missing is like the smell of bacon you know what i mean (laughs) <laughs> that would be it for me. You're like, I was just waking up, it was ooh, no, nice, like warm bro, coffee. Yeah. coffee. Oh, yeah, yeah, coffee. So I would breakfast, breakfast uh, bed. Yeah. You know? yeah. By the way, did you see Consumer Reports on the Chili Pad? I did. They crushed place. all beds. It's a big market now. Yeah. So now they're making beds that have systems that cool and heat. And it's a big, big market. Yeah. Uh, so Consumer Reports did a bunch of tests on all the top producers, and Chili and Uller crushed. Yeah. yeah. Beat them all. Number one. Yeah. Totally I did beat see them. That. That's super cool. Yeah, the bacon smell would wake me up, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know if that would I'm just <laughs> be kind of gross. Yeah. Though. Coffee, dude. That's that, a, that's, that's a, my weekend, though. I guess that's why. Yeah, coffee for sure. But like a bacon for me, it's just it's an extra draw. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. you know I'm what? Up. 
I got something for you guys that's weird. Hmm. So did you guys know? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look this up because I don't want to pronounce this wrong. So I read this really weird uh, article. Sometimes I look up weird news because Never. yeah, it's really really interesting yeah, stuff. You and me both. So there's something called uh, ambergis. I think I'm pronouncing it right. A M B E R G I S or ambergis. I don't know. Do you guys know what that is? I feel like I've heard this before. No. Okay. It's whale vomit. But yes. Okay. So that's what they use for these perfumes and things that, uh, yeah, and they harvest it. Dude, this woman. Well, don't they, don't they use like whale dick for like lipstick? Something like that? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I, no, it's phlegm. It's like they hawk the stuff up. Don't they use Where, um, whale dick? From, uh, uh, yeah. Whale dick. Yeah. That's what the whale told you, Adam? <laughs> you, just, you just carve off. No, I thought whale. I heard that. Hey, hey. I've never heard this one, but hey. I thought I heard. How many mushrooms did you eat? Yeah. I don't know. They, the whale told me to put it on his lipstick. Yeah. I kept doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna work. Yeah. No, dude. No, It'll think... make you pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Keep rubbing it on your lips. <laughs> Trust me. It's lipstick. No, no, no. This this woman in Thailand, I believe, found a huge lump of whale vomit. So she brought it home and Dude, they... it's like gold. Okay, so it was it's seven kilos, seven kilograms, uh that's how much it weighed. So twelve inches wide. How much tw- did she make? Twenty four inches long. Do you know how much it was valued at? What? Like 50,000. 14 pounds of vomit is uh, what? 186,000 pounds of dollar, dollars. 186,000. What? Yeah. So this stuff is expensive. Yeah. Extremely, extremely expensive. And Justin said it. They use uh, bits of it or whatever for perfumes and for- because Cologne and- Apparently, yeah. it causes the perfume to last a long time and it smells really Always good. Always hated the smell of perfume and cologne. Really? No, no really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't like you like the smell of perfume and cologne? Not too most you know I, I don't hate, at all. I hate floral perfumes. Oh yeah. god. I don't like perfumes at all. I a, a, a scented Not, none? No a, perfume? None. A, a scented lotion on a on a girl is enough, right? That, that's like that they, they have like, you know, Victoria's Secrets lotion that have all the different smells. That is a strong enough smell for me that it's like, oh, that smells really good. Perfume or cologne? Like my dude, my brother in law stayed at our place this last week because we took off right up to to Truckee. Aftershave everywhere. Oh, my, dude, my whole house for two <laughs> yeah. days smelled like cologne. Some man. people really overdo it. Oh, and I don't even think he really overdoes it that much. At least I didn't think he did until it, it gives me. Well, a he just probably has a really strong one. Yeah, bro, I had to open up all my windows and air it out for a day and a half just to get rid of that smell. So you don't like any? So what about body None. sprays? You know the no. ones that? Grow oh, that's well, even worse. You yeah, know what I'm talking do, about? I only do aftershave if I do anything. Yeah, I can't do cologne like. You spray yeah it's like way too strong so jessica's like she's a fanatic for cologne oh really oh yeah if i want to like if i want to like you know get her in a mood or what i just got sprayed on really oh yeah i feel like cologne and Mm. perfume is such a strong smell that it's like you're hiding not taking showers Mm. that's what i feel like so do you think it's the association that's that's the problem i don't know i don't know it's not the middle it's not the middle well no i also the hippie i also think i have like a really like sensitive like i can i whenever i walk i can walk into a room and like pick up on a smell right away and my allergies my nose itches all the time so i think i'm like extra sensitive i wonder do you know have you ever been Tested to see if you're a super taster. Oh, you mean like for like they do for like uh, sommeliers or whatever like that? Yeah. yeah. You know how much money those people yeah, make? Yeah, they make good money. Hella money, and all they yeah, do. But what do you got to taste? All, uh, that's, that, that's my wine. Uh, oh, just no. I know. I know. <laughs> I know sommeliers. I'm talking. You're talking about super oh. taster. Yeah. No. That's that's the that's re- all they do. Is that's, well, that's, that's where they make. I thought the most, they did it for like well, those guys make stuff. the most money. That's I think. where they make the most money. Yeah, I think yeah. they make the most. You money. You sit there and you take. I don't understand. By the way, I don't understand wine. You guys, are, you go wine tasting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is oaky. Yeah, this has a, <laughs> a just, hint. They of, just come up with adjectives. Yeah, this yeah. has a blackberry oaky flavor. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? It's yeah. got a tannin bark. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tastes like wine. Like what? Get me drunk. I'll take some more. This is a bold. Yeah, whatever. So you don't like any any women's perfumes, huh? No, not at all. Really? Yeah, yeah, no. And all. Yeah. But you know, you br- the the body spray for women. I feel is lighter than like the body acts. For so you men. like the you like the but lotions the, even better. You like the yeah, stripper lotion. smells is what you like. Yeah, like yeah, cotton candy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, as long as it has sparkles in it, like I'm in. That's yeah, the big yeah. joke in my house. Actually, Katrina, like I can always tell when Katrina's trying to get some because she comes out of the shower smell like cotton candy. Right? Yes. <laughs> And coming to the stage <laughs> is cinnamon. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> cinnamon. I know I'm getting so much Mercedes. Yeah. 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 Coming to the when stage. she smells like that, I know it's going down. Oh my night. god, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's that's uh, that's terrible. Oh, Bambi, yeah. mom just died. Yeah. But. Anyway, speaking of of uh, of smells and lotions and stuff like that, so I am getting. I didn't. I never. It's funny. We work with sponsors. Sometimes we say, I don't know. We'll see what happens. 
I keep getting DMs from people who use Caldera. A lot of guys. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. No, no, no. I, it's, I mean, shit, before you guys even started using it, I was getting a ton of messages like yeah. of people that have used it and just absolutely love it. I didn't it. think I would ever use it. I mean, I was like almost like, oh, really? Like, you're like, what? You guys are had to sell me hard on it. But uh, yeah, it's at this point, too. I'm, I'm, I don't know why, but we have places like that are really dry. Like, like so the truckies really dry. We go up yeah, there. Like, yeah. the desert, I go there every now and then. It's really dry but so i'm just like i was like cracking and like really ashy and like i was just putting that stuff on like i was gonna sit in a vat of that stuff <laughs> it works <laughs> all my hands well, you look you look more handsome right now yeah you do and I'm, younger yeah you know yeah. I, did, I, I didn't even know yeah you know, I mean, there's and, levels andrew put the camera on his face right yeah, now. yeah look at that oh my god Ooh. all right take it off because it's gonna get crazy <laughs> We can't go too hard with, with, with all of that. Hey, I wasn't you, ready for that. Hey, I read a crazy article. I'm, I want to hear you guys' opinion. So there's this uh, this professor. I can't remember where he teaches. Let me pull him up real quick. Oh, I thought you were talking about Dr. Seuss being racist. No. Jeez. Can you believe that? I mean, that, we all dude? knew. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Really? Horton hears a Really? Movie. Come yeah. on. No, Actually, dude, come on. Dude. Have you seen some of the. looking for something. Have you seen some of the pictures of that? I did not. I would, didn't even waste my time. I, I did not. Would not. It was going to rhyme. Keep going. <laughs> I could not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should not. <laughs> red, red fish, blue fish. Yeah. I don't give a fuck fish. Um, no, but anyway, so no, there's that's this racist. There's this one uh, professor from Columbia University. You might have seen him before. I'll show you guys a picture. This is Dr. Sue stuff. Are you? No, right? not okay. Dr. Sue. Have, have you seen this guy on TV before? He looks familiar. So super good looking, very smart. Oh yeah, he's part of the Profe secret, right? Uh, he might have been like yeah. black dude, right? He's got the he's got the don't long. Ask me why I know that? Dreads, good looking oh. dude or whatever. Anyway, Doug, he, you know who it is. Michael he, Beckwith, right? Oh, is oh, that his name? Beckworth. No, I'm sure. No, no, Why did no. you get so excited when you said his name, Doug? Uh, I know. No, no, no. You said the oh. dreads. I recognized yes. who he was. Uh, well, I don't know. I, uh, is that his name? Anyway. <laughs> oh. So, so a, a busted. A, I've watched his videos. So, a Columbia University professor, uh, I think that's they're talking about him, um, says that he uses a little bit of heroin every once in a while what? to You're improve right? the quality of his life. That's what he says. It. Wow. So here's what he said. Dude, the, you know what? We are heading this way. Remember we predicted this Hold a while on. ago about the drug thing. Dude, the, yeah. uh, microdosing of heroin is now going to have positive okay. benefits. Here well, here's what he says. Here it comes. This is his quote right here. Mm. It says, there aren't many things. It, his name is Carl Hart. Sorry, Doug. Um, Carl well, Hart. It, it pair, guy. It pairs with the opiate Carl. receptor, which is the same thing that makes you feel good and happy. So it, I could totally see well, how- Well, you've heard of these cultures that like uh, you know work really hard, but they also have like little bumps of coke or- like, <laughs> yeah. have, you know, like, Meth. Yeah, but, but I, I mean- like it, it's part of a culture like it's like you know they're, they're chewing coca leaves you know and they're just trying to get through their day but they're very productive and like this is something well like anything it, it's else small doses yeah as i say like anything else found in nature and in small doses and and you know done infrequently is probably actually not bad at all well so jessica chewed coca leaves she went on a i don't remember where she was she's been all over the world I have so too. I it's awesome but yeah. she she was doing one great. of those hikes and that's what they give you they give you coca leaves mm -hmm. uh, now it's not the same as like you know C cocaine no. it's much less strong i have heard though of like yeah little microdosing uh heroin and like like crazy like hardcore drugs like in some cultures where they're like the, it just it helps them level out well or here, something. here's what it's his quote he says this is his quote he goes there aren't many things in life that i enjoy more than a few lines by the fireplace at the end of the day <laughs> <laughs> he says <laughs> the experience leaves him refreshed and prepared to face another day what? now he's a very uh accomplished professor um but here's what he says he says he finds it to be as rational as his alcohol use. Like vacation, sex, and the arts, heroin is one of the tools I use to maintain my work-life balance. Now, here's the truth. Yeah, what's the response to this? Well, though? here's what's the deal. On? Let's be. Let's 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 talk about this objectively, right? Yeah. You know, drugs definitely have a different. Like, there's a different. It's almost like uh, drugs have their own PR agencies, right? Yeah. And some drugs like crack got really bad PR, and some drugs like you know marijuana now has got seems to have really good PR. And I definitely, it's proven that some drugs have way more uh, capacity for abuse than others. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, I, I mean, if you're an adult, first off, it's your body. It, I, I think you could probably, I, I could see this because look, alcohol has caused way more damage uh, than almost any other drug well, on the planet. Well, because it's accepted, just like caffeine is. Right, right. You know, and that's, I think that's just it. I think that drugs like- <laughs> I'm they, not going to go do heroin, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I just think they they fall into the wrong hands, typically, right? Yeah. The, the wrong person gets a hold of, of all of these drugs, and that's where it's bad. It's well, not it's not the drug so much. It's the, the behavior- They're just looking to escape from life in yeah, general. It's, and yes. it's, it's the behaviors that are around that. But if you are somebody who's very self-aware, you know the addictive properties, you know if you were medicating on a, in a, on a regular- 
regular basis that you're abusing it. If you've got that awareness and you use it, well, then it- I mean, you hear all the time like uh, Silicon Valley execs and all like the, the, are microdosing, you know, mm-hmm. psilocybin and LSD all the time. Like I hear stories of this all the time in athletes even, and you'd be like, "What? Well, That's crazy." Well, the the understanding of addiction has changed, right? It used to be we thought addiction was a lot about the substance. The substance was so powerful, yeah, you just can't control yourself over it. That it makes you it makes you become uh, addicted and then kill yourself. And the way they based it were, were animal studies. And what they would do is they would take a rat, for example, and they put the rat in a cage, and then they give the rat access to water and food or water with cocaine in it, for example. Mm-hmm. And the rat would use the cocaine over and over again until it, you know, basically almost killed itself or whatever caused lots of harm to yeah. itself. And so they said, there it is. Yeah. Cocaine or whatever they drug. Prefer cocaine to water. Yeah, it's so it's it's so <laughs> End of story. it's so powerful that you just can't resist yeah. yourself. Yeah, you won't drink water. You'll just do lines yeah. of coke. <laughs> but yeah. the, but the reality is, it's a it's a rat in a cage, right? Yeah. So it, it's depressed. Exactly. I could imagine if all of us were locked up in Despite a cage. All its rage. And we, <laughs> <laughs> and you guys are on fire. Yeah, it is good. If we were locked up in a cage and given access to drugs, we'd all probably, you know, just give us access to alcohol. We'd probably drink uh, like crazy, well, right? Well, look at what's going on with food. Because it's so widely accepted and we have and, an abundance of it. And people have problems elsewhere. They use the food to medicate. Yes. Right? Yes. So what they, they have other studies now where they give rats open you know, uh, areas, they have mates to play with and to mate with and to do all this other stuff. Yeah. And they find the use goes way the fuck down. Little rat utopias. Yeah. When you find an addict, you almost always find underlying reasons. So it's not the drug. That was just their way of finding. That was just their- Yeah, it's their, what they're bringing into a really powerful substance. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And this is what, look, I'll tell you what, as a trainer, how many times have you guys dealt with food addicts? And, yeah. and it wasn't the food; it mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. this underlying shit that right, caused the right. problems. No, hundred, and that's what I mean by the the wrong person gets a hold of a lot of these drugs. Listen, there's a lot of people that a, a lot, and it, I didn't start to learn this until I got much older. There's a lot of people that use a lot of these recreational drugs. Oh, millions! That millions you millions would of, not have any idea yeah. about it. Yes, because they just got their shit together. Because they they don't do it. They every, don't advertise it. They don't do it every night. They don't do it even every week. It's something that they've learned that they can dabble in and out of, and they know that how strong and addictive it is, and how dangerous it can be. And so they've they've been able to balance that in their life. That just no one talks about because it it's so taboo. Right. Yeah. Like heaven forbid. Like th- that's what's so crazy about this article is this guy's coming out being like, hey. You know, I can be a PhD, do all these things, probably write some books, and I can do some heroin well, every now and then. Well, here, here, let me give you an example. What if I said, you know, on the days that I really need to focus and work hard, you know, I'll have a little bit of uh, amphetamines just to get me going. I'll have a little bit of that. And people, oh my God, you do what? And like, yeah, it's Adderall. Right. It's a prescription right. amphetamine. <laughs> but if you said meth, it would freak everybody right, out. Right, right. Be- better but, brand name. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or or what if I said, oh, I got back pain, you know, so I take, uh, you know, Percocet. To help my back or whatever, it's a opiate. Yeah. It's yeah. like heroin, yeah. Yeah. It's just in, in pill p- form. In pill form, right? So it's really it's it's the people behind it. So we have to change. So what our is approach. okay? So I, I didn't you know anything about this guy. Like, are you reading what the backlash is? Are people freaking out? Well, yeah, like, people are, are freaking out. But I think that the the war on drugs has been such an absolute failure. Attitudes are starting to shift and change around it. You're starting to see. And the laws that we put on on the on war on drugs to curtail its use, first of all, were used as weapons politically. We know this. We know that the we had a crazy cultural wars in the 60s and 70s, and the U.S. government uh, saw a lot of these protesters uh, who were against the Vietnam War. And by the way, you know, however crazy last year was with protests and stuff, it pales in comparison to what we saw in the 60s uh, and in the 70s. And the government actually saw this as a threat. What do we do? They're protesting peacefully. We can't throw them in jail. Mm -hmm. And they came up with a brilliant idea. Why don't we make the drugs that they use so illegal that we can then throw them in jail? And and that's where the the real hard war on drugs came from. And then, of course, behind it were people who were like, yeah, people shouldn't use drugs. I see what drug addicts do. Let's definitely punish people. And then states started enacting these crazy Laws where these minimum sentence laws, where if you're found with, you know, you know, anything more than a gram of whatever drug, minimum five years in jail. 
like that's not going to cause more problems than the actual you know drug itself. Well, so, they also found too that uh, I don't know if it was FBI or CIA had uh, you know had agents that would go in provocateurs uh, agents that would go into these uh, peaceful uh, protests and, and, and sell and, drugs. No, they would get violent and start uh, violent and oh, like yeah, uh, yeah like th that way they could shut it down. Old school Antifa or something. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> I mean, remember, well, let's just think about that. Like like that like it's a very successful tactic to to shut down what you don't, you don't want. Yeah, I don't think anything's new that we saw this year. Yeah, I think just, it's just they've reinvented it and, and and now we have you know all a million psychological eyes on games on everybody. Yeah, and you we have social media now. We just didn't have the access to know what's going on in every state like by the minute all the time. Mm -hmm. And so like you said, it was way worse back in the 60s and 70s. It's yeah. just you didn't get it reported to you. You know, it had it in order to get that it had to be so big it made it to the news where you see every incident. Well, I was tripping out because so like I rent this place out now and I I didn't realize people still watch regular TV. Yeah, like 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 we've moved on to streaming. Yeah. Like we have all these services we talk about all the time. Like, but there's there's people that just want to turn on the TV. I want to look at like NBC, and I want to go to this stupid sitcom, and I want to go to this thing. And it's like they're still living in that same, uh, you know, programming. And it's 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 hilarious to me that it's it's still a thing. Yeah, it is. But you know, uh, I so I watched regular TV not that long ago. Do you know how weird it was watching a Dude, commercial? Laugh tracks. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, in the background. <laughs> like I want to kill myself. Hey, you talk about psychology yeah. though, right? It does make you want to laugh. Of course. Watch oh. watch an episode of Friends without the laugh in the background, and it's just a shitty it's show. It's so phony. Dude. I said it. It's a shitty show without oh, the laugh in the background. Oh my god! Sorry. Yeah. Didn't hey. have our audience. Oh, hey. That's Woo. Jessica's favorite show all time. Oh, that's oh yeah. terrible. Friends is her favorite. The only good one was yeah, where he like I forget what his name is Ross or whatever. Yeah. Like, he he made a song in, in a robot. Song. <laughs> no. That was the only good episode. Yeah, the Anyways. one with the robot song. Probably. <laughs> the robot song. I'll, I'll take that one. That's probably time. I was a Seinfeld guy. Yes. Put, yeah, put yeah, Seinfeld, yeah. Seinfeld on. Yes. Great. I'll watch that all day. Yeah, over. yeah. That that doesn't even need a laugh track. That's just good humor no, right there. There it is. That's how I feel. <laughs> all right. Before we get started with the live questions, a quick message. Uh, so in this next portion, you're gonna hear us answering questions from live people who want coaching on air. Now, one guy we talked to, Barry, uh, is talking about getting leaner. He wants to get more cut. If you go to mindpumpfree.com, we have a free guide called How to Lose Fat in Three Steps. It's very valuable, and it costs nothing. It's totally free. Go to mindpumpfree.com. Go check it out. Download it. In fact, we have other guides there as well. They're all totally free. All right. Enjoy this portion. All right. Our first caller is Anna from Wisconsin. Hey, Anna. How can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, it's nice talking to you. Um, I've listened to your podcast for a couple of years here, and I've loved everything you've been able to um, provide to everybody. But my question is, um, I'm 22. I've been working out consistently for about seven to eight years. Um, I work out five to seven days a week, and I have been doing that for um, since I began working out. Um, and as of right now, I've been having a plateau. Um, I've been feeling unstable with my squats and my deadlifts. Um, I do work out more for like overall health, um, but I was just wondering if you guys could, could provide me with some assistance on maybe a program to buy of one of your guys's or anything that I could do to help assist my squats, my deadlift, and my overall strength. Okay. Uh, thank you very much mm. for a little bit of that background because I was going to ask you those questions. I do have some more questions though. Um, let's talk about your diet for a second. Do you know like grams of protein, how many calories you're eating, and are you eating in a deficit, a surplus? Um, so I do supplement in protein, um, just because I don't believe I get enough of it through whole foods. Um, I do have to do more vegan based protein, um, when it comes to protein powders, just because I can't handle dairy. Um, I would say I'm taking in about 80 to 90 grams. Um, I'm not currently tracking right now, uh, but I eat a very regular diet. Um, it's very consistent. So I'm um, about 80 to 90 grams of protein a day. Um, I'm usually on average around 1500 calories. Sometimes I do go up to 18. Um, overall, I do watch what I eat because um, I do have celiac disease and heart disease does run in my family. So um, I am being watched under a dietitian for that. And then how about programming? What does your training look like right now? Do you have a program you're currently following or how do you typically train? Um, so I did see a personal trainer for a couple years. Um, so a lot of my programming is based off of what he had prescribed to me. Um, I do like to put together my own programs. I do legs about two to three times a week. If it is three times, it's more like an overall body workout. And then I um, go on to like upper body the other days of the week. And then I do do cardio um, 
on the day on like usually the seventh day of the week mm. just to kind of give my body some rest. How, how tall are you and how much do you weigh if you don't mind me asking? Um, I'm five, three and I weigh about 127 pounds. Okay. So you're, you're, you're probably pretty lean, um, working out that much, that body weight, uh, that height. Um, I'm going to recommend when's the last time you went on like a bulk. And what I mean by that is not a crazy bulk, but rather you ate and trained in a way to gain as much strength as possible. I guess I haven't necessarily ever gone on a major bulk or like a, your guys, the so-called bulk. Um, I do try to increase my calories every like eight weeks, I would say, where I do do a couple weeks where I'm eating a little bit more. Um, I try to train a little bit heavier and then do a little less cardio. That's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, I did increase my carbs um, and I'm increasing my protein currently just to see if that was going to help my plateau. Awesome. Okay. So here's what I'm going to recommend to you. Um, you mentioned that your calories are about 15 to 1800 um, and you're working out five to seven days a week. So I'm going to recommend that you increase your calories again, closer to 2000. And the program I think you should follow would be MAPS Powerlift. Now here's why. Uh, MAPS Powerlift is strength focused, purely strength focused. And it's going to be a good idea to, to, to take your focus away from how you look and focus on pure strength with the bump in calories. Now, here's what you'll probably notice by doing that, especially with your history of exercise. Your body weight may go up a little bit, but it's going to be muscle, or it'll stay the same, and you'll see a nice transfer of, uh, of weight or changing composition, I should say, where you get a little bit leaner and you build a little bit more muscle and your strength goes up. I think that'll do you really good for a few mm -hmm. months. Well, I also like that recommendation because you had mentioned you had a little bit of instability uh, as you were gradually adding load uh, uh, to those main lifts. And I and obviously that program itself really emphasizes those lifts and teaches you the skill of those lifts. Uh, and I think that would be a, a really helpful addition. Just out of curiosity, Anna, where, where is your squat and deadlift? How much are you squatting and deadlifting currently? So I actually had um, a little bit of back injury um, and I did have a significant pelvic um, tilt. So as of right now, I'm cutting back on heavy weight just because I'm trying to get my form back to how it's supposed to be. I was overcompensating um, on my left side compared to my right. So as of right now, I'm only squatting about 100 just because I do have the instability and I'm trying to get my body back to what it's supposed to be doing. So um, it's not as high as it has been, um, but I am slowly progressing and kind of working my way up with doing more resistance bands and getting back to that those staple lifts mm. than doing more isolation. Yeah, isolation. That, that was a great question, Adam. I, I would say then in that case, MAPS Powerlift plus uh, MAPS Prime Pro for the correctional component. But I really do think if you did like a three-month focus on just strength, you bumped your calories, you worked on uh, the correctional stuff for MAPS Prime Pro, which you can do every single day, and then you followed MAPS Powerlift, and really in an appropriate, intelligent way, which uh, I have quite a bit of confidence you'll do that just from listening to you talk for the last couple minutes. I think you'll, you'll be pretty smart with the weight that you use, but you, you get your strength up and focus just on that, all, of course, appropriately. I think you'll be very, very satisfied with how your body responds. So what we're going to do, by the way, is we're going to give you those. I know you said you want to buy a program, but because you called in, uh, we're going to hook you up with both of those programs. But I do want you to follow up. Let us know uh, how it's working out for you. You say you say you notice like a, a shift in your hips when you when you're squatting. Is that what you said? Yeah, um, I was a competitive figure skater for about 14 years. Um, so I did have an ACL and MCL tear and also a hip injury um, hmm. that I've kind of struggled with hip, uh, doing my squats and deadlifts for a while. So ever since then, I do catch myself overcompensating on one side than the other because of that. Have you, have mm. you, uh, are you familiar with Miguel Plains? I don't believe so. So Google that when we get off here on YouTube and watch that. I would recommend before you get into your squatting that you, you prime and warm up with that before you get in. That'll help with the stability and, and, and your shifting from side to side when you squat. Perfect. All right. Thank you for calling in. Yeah. Thank you guys. Have a great day. You too. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, so many, especially young girls her age, would benefit so much the bulk. from just mm -hmm. focusing on getting stronger for a few months. Yeah, yeah. That's it, not marketed at all. Yeah, yeah, No, not at all. It's, in fact, they're, or they're, it's marketed the opposite. Um, but they would, uh, every time I've ever trained a client, young female like that, 
it's always a new novel stimulus because they never train that way. Mm -hmm. And then when I introduce it, they're like blown away. Oh my gosh, yeah. I can't believe. It's like, I'm wow, like, I'm so strong. I'm strong. My body's shaping the way I've always wanted it to. My mm -hmm. metabolism is boosting. My libido is going up. My hormones seem to be balancing because they never really focus on you know, building uh, muscle and strength in a real serious way. Talk about being ahead of the game, though. I mean, she's very aware of everything going on with her body. Yeah, I mean, she's very sharp. Yeah, I mean, yeah. at that age to already know that uh, you have, like, a, an issue with an imbalance when you're squatting, to know that you have this slight anterior pelvic tilt, to be well, focused on strength, like... The skill of uh, competitive figure skating, I mean. Yes. She's got, like, great body awareness. You have to at that point. Yeah, and right. she's used to working with uh, coaches one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, can't, you don't get to that level unless you do, so I think... That's why I felt so confident giving her advice to focus on strength because it sounds like she's going to be smart about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our next caller is Cliff from Georgia. Hey, Cliff, how can we help you? Hey, yeah, I was just, uh, I started working out back in August. Uh, I'm 41 years old. Um, I dropped 35 pounds and now I'm just kind of stuck. And I was thinking about beginning like a cutting and bulking phase and I have no idea where to start with that. Which way do I go? How do I know which one's the right step? Do I change my workout with cutting and bulking? Oh, good question. And first off, congratulations on losing 35 pounds. How long did that take you to, to do? Um, I just, I weighed in, weighed in uh, last week. So I'm at, uh, I started at 246. I was at 211.5 uh, last week. So how, Six months or so, I guess. Okay. So it, it sounds like you've already been cutting um, because you've lost uh, 35 pounds in about six months, which is a relatively, that's a pretty good pace. So I don't think you should keep cutting if you found you're at, you're, you're at a plateau. I would do a slight reverse. Okay. So I would increase your calories a little bit, not a ton, a little bit. And then I would focus on building uh, strength and muscle. Um, you said you just started working out in August. What does your routine look like? What is what do you, what do your workouts typically look like per week? I, I've been doing like a, a full body type deal um, four to five times a week. You know, if I I go early in the morning, so if I wake up and I'm tired, I just I, I don't have a rest day set in stone. If I'm just not. I just let my body tell me if, if, if it's not feeling it, then I, I, I use that as a rest day and go to the next day. Okay. Well, that's actually, uh, that's actually not a bad strategy. Any cardio or just, uh, the strength training? I've just been doing strength training. Oh, good. Yeah. Nice. That's actually really good to have dropped that kind of weight and you haven't been doing any cardio whatsoever right now. Yeah. I would, I would yeah. say, uh, Cliff, I would say maps anabolic would is made specific. I mean, it's perfect for someone like you and I would start in pre-phase I would do the foundational workouts three days a week since you've already been working out because you can choose between two to three days a week. And then I would do the trigger sessions on the off days. I think that would be the perfect uh, workout routine for you. But as far as diet is concerned, I would definitely go on a bulk, but I would do it very slowly. So you want to take your average calories that you're consuming on a daily basis and bump them by two to 300 calories and stay there for a few weeks see how you feel, and then do it again. Um, and then continue to go up unless you see too much of a rapid weight gain, in which case I would stop uh, adding calories, maybe do a little bit of a cut, and then back into the bulk. But you're ready to go into the into the gaining portion now of training because mm -hmm. for six months you've already been cutting. Cliff, have you, uh, have you tracked calories? Yeah. Do you have any idea where you're at? No, I haven't really been tracking calories. I've just been trying to uh... – make better decisions and I, I made up uh my rule of two so i get two restaurants two beers and two sodas every two weeks <laughs> i like that <laughs> that's hey, that's this is but it's just, it's, you're on to something that worked worked for me you're on to something i, I think so i, I think I, you can write a book I, I should probably copyright that <laughs> yeah, or, yeah i was gonna uh, say i think you, you know, got a i think you got a diet book way rule right. of two <laughs> <laughs> drop a deuce I, I yeah like i said it it wasn't nothing intentional. It's just something I did so I wouldn't like force myself into a situation where I knew I would fail. You, you know, I mean, I, I just didn't want to kill everything and be crazy about mm -hmm. it because mm -hmm. I knew that uh, 
Smart. You know, if yeah, I decided to have a beer, I, I would I would have twelve and not two. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, no, that's yeah. I, that's that's brilliant, and it and it just highlights that you've able you've been able to do that, no cardio, and you still lost a lot of weight in a short period of time, which is probably why Sal's pushing you in the direction of a bulk. It means that you probably actually just by doing that and cutting out a lot of other things you've probably reduced calories pretty significantly to what you were doing before, and the body's probably ready to be fed. So I would increase calories, good calories, right? So that doesn't mean we get to have uh, the rule of four now instead of the rule of two. Uh, <laughs> st- start adding in a little bit of uh, maybe an extra healthy meal a day in there. That's a good balance of protein, carbs, and fat, and and see where your body responds. And I'd probably do that pretty consistently for about four weeks or so before I probably reduce back down a little bit and see how your body responds. I have to warn you, though, because if you've been training four to five days a week and then you jump into the pre-phase of anabolic, like Sal suggesting, it will seem like very little at first. And I think that's one of the hardest things for people that have already been training for a little while is they see the program and they think, oh, man, I, I can do so much more than this. But if you trust the process and follow the entire program through the way it's laid out, I think you'll see great results. Yeah, and I got to echo, too. I was going to jump in uh, uh, about like starting to kind of dial in and, and dial in like what you're actually consuming and start tracking a bit. I know it's a bit of a pain in the ass, but like uh, what you did initially is brilliant uh, to get you, uh, you know, some progress and be really uh, aware of your own habits. But now once you hit that plateau, it's like we got to sort of like peer into that a bit further and see what uh, that actually looks like. So you could just make little micro tweaks. So this isn't like big adjustments out of your daily routine. It's just this is what my tendencies are. Now I'm going to tighten it up a little bit. And a great place to start because I think that's great advice from Justin. The great place to start is actually if you haven't done this already is just start tracking protein. Yep. Just start tracking protein and make sure you hit your protein intake while you're also following the MAPS anabolic program, uh, that that should do you pretty well. Yeah, and we're going to send that to you, by the way. So we, when we hang up here, Doug is going to uh, send over MAPS anabolic so you'll have access. Awesome. I appreciate that, fellas. I really I really do. And like, like I said, I, I've this was just like my beginning phase. It's pretty general. I mean, the hardest part's getting there. And uh, now I'm like, well, what what do, what do I do now? What direction do I go in? Because I'm kind of flatlined. Now, 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 Cliff, I'm going to say this to you, okay? So, you know, I've been training people for a long time, okay? And I can usually tell right out the gates if someone has the right attitude or the wrong attitude. And most of my training was dedicated to getting people in the right mindset. You're almost all the way there. You got the right uh, mindset. Um, in fact, what you're saying right now oftentimes takes me years mm-hmm. to get people to 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 start with. So everything you're saying is you're on the right track. I think you're gonna, you have a very very good chance of long term success. Well, I, I hope so, and I, I appreciate it. Y'all y'all have helped me out quite a bit. Just uh, kind of keeping me focused and keeping me going in the right direction and being able to uh, pluck things out that I can put into my own routine. You know. Yeah. Good deal, man. Thanks Great. for calling. Yeah, awesome clip. Thanks, I appreciate it, y'all. That's uh, that's a, an ideal client. Oh right? yeah, I know, right? That's no, exactly. No. If, he's as killing it right out of the gate. I mean, shoot. what he said uh, about I, I wanted to, you know, start and with something I knew I wouldn't fail. So self-aware, yeah. so perfect, yeah, right? right? A very simple, easy rule that was realistic for him. Very, very, very simple. Made a lot of sense. And it just highlights that he can still have this balance, you know, of eating out, mm-hmm. having a b- occasional beer so that no cardio. Mm-hmm. And a dr- 35 pounds in six months is almost too fast. Substantial. It, right, right. It's, it's plenty fast. In fact, he probably reduced a lot of things that he was eating that was not ideal so much that he dropped more than he even needed yeah. to in that short period of time. So he's on the right track. His body's probably wanting more calories right now. And I think that's the perfect thing for him is to increase, but increase with good choice. Mm-hmm. and go through like a strength phase type of programming and his body's going to respond yeah. great. And, and what he said about, mm-hmm. you know, my, when my body's tired, I take a break. So oh, yeah. I mean, oh, listening yeah. to your body, you know how hard that is to get people to do? <laughs> yeah. I know. You know, I mean, you could... You, you, you could can program it all day, but if you're not paying attention to what your body's signals are, yeah. like, uh, good luck. Yeah, in yeah. fact, if you're listening right now, that's the attitude you want. Even though he's a beginner and he doesn't probably have a lot of knowledge, he's got the right attitude and that's way more important than the than the actual knowledge. Absolutely. Our next caller is Caroline from Colorado. Hey, Caroline, how can we help you? Hi, I uh, I recently finished running anabolic, and I tried to be in a calorie deficit for the last half of the program, but toward the end, my nutrition fell pretty inconsistent. Um, I'm in college, so it's kind of hard to stay on track all the time. Um, 
and right now my goals are more centered on strength and mobility um, as well as just like figuring out what to do with my nutrition um, I have a history of disordered eating so I kind of realized that the whole like cut bulk approach is probably not the best for me um, so I guess I just wanted to ask you guys what your advice is for where to go from here in my workouts as well as um, how to like rein in my nutrition when everything feels all over the place. Mm. Very, very, very good question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a few more questions, Caroline, just to get more information from you. Um, when you. What do you notice when you put a lot of focus on your nutrition? Do you find yourself swinging strongly from end to end? In other words, you focus on it and then you go off, but you go off on a bit in a big way. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So the advice I'm going to give you may sound counterintuitive, but, um, in my experience it with, with situations like yours, uh, I think this might be the best thing. I think you should not focus on your nutrition. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to, you know, try to eat healthy and all that kind of stuff. I mean, take the, the, the magnifying glass off your nutrition, stop focusing so much on it. And instead I want you to train and focus on strength. And when it comes to nutrition, I want you to bring awareness to how the food makes you feel. So try to eat in ways that improve your strength and your health. And that's about all the focus you should place because in, in a situation like yours, the more you focus on nutrition, the more elusive it's going to get. The more you start to develop this bad relationship uh, with food. Caroline, do you actually do you own our intuitive eating guide? I don't. Okay, that's oh, perfect. A, that's a must. So we'll have Doug ship that over to you. And then my other recommendation, because you did say strength and mobility, um, you you could run anabolic again, but my recommendation would be to move on to performance, which is the natural progression from anabolic, which is heavily mobility focused. And there's a lot of unique exercises that a lot of people are not familiar with. So take your mind off of the nutrition stuff, focus more on strength and learning new exercises, uh, and then doing the mob mobility days on your uh, your off strength days, and then intuitive eating as, a, as the main mm -hmm. focus of any sort of nutrition focus at all, I think would serve you really well. Yeah. Caroline, do you, do you think that you're somebody worth taking care of? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, that's what I want you to focus on. Okay. So- uh, imagine if you had a, a, a child or a friend that you were taking care of, when you're taking care of that person, you're not going to be overly strict, but you're all, you're also not going to be overly indulgent with them. Right. So, you know, like I have kids and sometimes I let them have cookies. Uh, and, but a lot of times I don't because it's not good for them. Sometimes it is good for them to have one. Other times it's not. Uh, and that's because I care about them and I take care of them like I care about them. That's the focus I want you to have with your nutrition. I don't want you to focus on mm -hmm. calories, macros. Oh my gosh, I ate, you know, I ate a cupcake yesterday. Oh, I ate too much, you know, today or I didn't eat enough. Putting too much focus on nutrition is probably not a good idea for you right now. Instead, focus on how you feel, taking care of yourself, and then if you if you need to place your focus on something, Focus on your performance in the gym. More often than not, it'll point you in the right direction because it's hard to eat in a way that makes you unhealthy and improve your performance. So if you need to focus mm -hmm. on something, focus on performance, and that should help. And then, of course, taking care of yourself, and that should start to direct you in the right way. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys so much. No problem. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the irony of you know, having issues with food is that you think, oh, I have stuff, I have to deal with these food issues. Let me focus on them even more. Right. And it makes it way worse. Yeah, I kept thinking because I remember my college experience and I was going to ask her about, um, you know, be the dorm life and having to, to eat at the cafeteria all the time. But then that's going to just reiterate, uh, you know, the focus of just like trying to scramble and figure this whole nutrition thing out when I think your your advice is great in terms of like relieving her of that stress. Well, oh, yeah. it's so nice that we, we're getting questions where people are, are honest enough to admit this. Yes. Because yeah. honestly, most of my experience with clients, you don't get that the first encounter. When you first meet clients and they're telling you about their goals, it's very surface. Mm -hmm. You know, you rarely get somebody to be like, oh, by the way, too, I have a little bit of an eating disorder or a challenge there. They don't even mention that normally. It so, takes like a year of training yeah. someone before they open yes. up. Yes. So it helps us be able to advise better because not knowing any better, I would tell this person, oh, let's start tracking food and let's mm -hmm. see where your calories are and start mm -hmm. getting them to focus on that. Uh, but it's important that, you know, for people that are listening, I know we talk a lot about, and I talk a lot about, 
um, how much I think tracking calories and food is so important to learning. But uh, there's always an exception to the rule. This is an exception to the rule. When you have somebody that has had eating disorders in the past, uh, that could be the worst thing to actually advise them to. Yes, and mm-hmm. and, again, and I want to make sure I say this on the podcast very clear. Obviously, none of us are uh, you know therapists uh, in in that field. If you're listening and you're somebody that really has an issue with nutrition um, in that in that particular way, um, the best thing you could do is work with a therapist or counselor who is experienced uh, and and qualified in that arena. But again, it is very interesting. Uh, it's one of those things. It's like you know, putting hyper focus hyper focus on nutrition causes more anxiety and stress around nutrition, which then causes you to do the very things that you're worried about in the first place. And what it looks like is I'm obsessively strict and then I go so far off, I hate myself. Mm -hmm. And it's this this in and out, terrible relationship that continues to spiral and get worse. And it's either I become, uh, you know, so ridiculously strict and anal about my nutrition that I lose my friendships and I lose myself, or I go in so bad of the opposite direction that I cause myself health problems. So oftentimes just taking your focus off of that, placing it on something else. Um, and then just constantly thinking, how can I take care of myself? A lot of people mm-hmm. are unaware they have this issue too. Oh yeah. Because mm-hmm. they've seen success, you know, just because you, you track, you weigh, you measure, you do these things and you have a streak of six months of getting in great shape doesn't mean this potentially isn't a problem for you also, you know? So I think that's, what's tough is a lot of clients you get are unaware that they even have this on or off the wagon type of mm-hmm. issue. They think that's just how that how this process goes. Either I'm focused on a goal mm-hmm. and I have a wedding, or I have Vegas in a, in a couple months and I'm dialed in, mm-hmm. and then and or I'm off, and that's a lot of times the problem. Yeah. Our next caller is Barry from Tennessee. Hey Barry, how can we help you? Hey guys, uh, love what y'all are doing. Keep doing it. Uh, my question is, uh, one of my, one of my goals, I've got a, a few goals, but one is to get to around 12% body fat. Uh, not really going after a six pack. I have too much fun on the weekends for that. More of a, a four pack type of guy. Yeah, um, but if I hover nice. around, if I, yeah, if I hover around 15% body fat, most of the time, uh, I've never really gotten super lean. Um, so main question is, should I focus heavily on gaining muscle and strength and just staying fed and let the body kind of metabolism do its thing? Or should I try to go uh, on a bit of a cut? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Barry, how long have you been sitting at about 15% body fat? Uh, I, I feel like it's my – and again, this it, I haven't gone somewhere to get it professionally uh, tested. I had calipers and I, and I tested it a few – um, probably three weeks ago, um, really tested it after COVID kept me from going into the gym. I was doing a lot of at home workout being sedentary. Um, but just from, from pictures of myself, I I think I, I tend to hover around that for a long time. Uh, I played lacrosse in college, so I was probably closer to 12 or 10% body fat back in, you know, 2012, um, but since then, I've kind of gotten a little fluffy. Okay. Well, if you've been at 15 for a while, I'd say let's let's do a cut. Let's see, drop down a little bit because, and here's why, um, When and one of my favorite things about dropping body fat is the after when I start to bulk again. So if you go down to 12 or 11 and then slowly increase the calories, you're going to see this nice muscle rebound. It's like the body, it's almost like a sponge when you do that for a little while, and it could take you, you know, going from 15 to 12 percent body fat, if you do it at a nice even pace, it would take you about I don't know six to nine weeks if you do it at a nice slow pace. Um, and at the end of that, increase your calories and focus on getting stronger. And it's going to be real fun. It's really fun at that point to feel the muscle and strength gains after a cut. This is also a place where I would highly recommend starting to actually track food, right? To kind of see where you're at. Because it sounds like if you've been hovering around that 15 to 16, you've kind of found, uh, you know, your your natural body fat percentage that your body likes to be at with your lifestyle. Meaning you enjoy the weekends every now and yep. then. You have consist- consistency probably during the week. 
And if you're going to break that plateau, you're going to need to peer in a little bit more to yeah. exactly you what you might you're... need to switch to white claws, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's I, painful, but I yeah. would I would say you would you would want to peer into your nutrition uh, a little bit to get a, a closer look on exactly kind of what you're doing calorie wise and protein and carbs and fats, and then from there take the advice that Sal's saying, go on a cut for like four to six weeks and try and lean out and then re- reintroduce. And I don't. And what may happen during that time is you may have to tighten things up on the weekend while you're trying to lean out depending on where you're yep. currently at so i mean i definitely okay. think because when you're around that just by the way too for the audience that's listening when you're around where you're at you sound like you're in a pretty healthy place mm-hmm. so if you're if you were just trying to be healthy i'd say you're probably kicking ass at it i mean you work out you exercise you maintain about 15 to 16 percent. i mean shit you're leaner than sal and justin right now so that's a pretty good <laughs> that's a pretty good <laughs> it's a pretty good place to be right now so I don't think there's anything wrong with where you're at, but if you want to take it to the next level, lean out and see how your body responds. That you're probably going to have to take your tracking and, and following your nutrition a little bit tighter. Yeah, no, I'm I'm 14.8 percent, Adam. So I'm actually a little leaner than. The, <laughs> He's got than, a few points. I'm on leaner that. than Barry. Hey, Barry, what does your workout look like? Uh, so during December, January, half of February, I uh, got out of the gym and was doing uh, a lot of TRX. Uh, I, I got y'all's TRX program and uh, y'all's Maps Anywhere program. Was doing those with just body weight and stuff. Uh, got finally got back in the gym about a uh, week and a half ago and started Maps Anabolic. Thought that would be a good one, so I'm on. Uh, just started second week of uh, phase one of oh, Anabolic. Ah, uh, beautiful. Nice. This right, is this right is when the track. yeah this is when the strength gains really start to kick in. It's it's, it's a good time. Phase one is my favorite. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, perfect. Thanks thanks for calling in, Barry. Yeah, thank you, guys. Y'all have a good one. No problem. One. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're at something for that long, and that's a good, you know, 15% is not... It's over, a great place. It's not overweight. Yeah. It's, it's not gr- super lean. Comfortable. It's, it is, and if you have good muscle under it, you're healthy, fit, you look good with your shirt Which off. Which he probably does because he's he's stayed consistent even during COVID. He's on anabolic mm-hmm. right now, so the guy is probably pretty strong, probably doing really well. You know, if the if his goal was health, then I'd tell him he's right. He's doing perfect mm-hmm. right now. But if you want to take your body to the next level, mm-hmm. and you and you want to lean out from there, this is where this is where I think because this is what we run into with a lot of people yeah. is they get got to dabble. They've got they get into this place where. You know, they, the the body just kind of finds this homeostasis for them, which for him is probably this 15, which allows him to have this flexibility mm-hmm. of kind of eating what he wants every now and then and not really having to track. But then when you say, hey, I have a, a goal, like I want to lean out to a certain percentage, this is where I just, you got to track. You got to see where you're at to get an idea because what will end up happening is you'll have one or two good weeks where maybe you start to lean out and then you'll have a high week. And then at, when you pull back and look at it over four weeks, you're kind of staying the same. You're not really making any progress. That's kind of weird how the body just naturally does that. You know, if you cut back for a couple of weeks and you're not eating very much, sure, you start to lean out, but then you're really hungry that following week and then you start to overconsume a little bit and it all levels out to be that 15, 16%. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio, so you can come find us on YouTube if you want to watch the podcast. You can also find all of us on social media. Instagram is the place to get us. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Here's what we need to worry about, okay? If you're going to drink, have your meals planned out for yourself because that's where people really screw up the most. You can add up all the calories from the drinks. It usually doesn't even come close to the calories that they have from the food mm-hmm. that comes along with the drinks. Oh, and that was a game changer for me and my Well, class. especially when you – and I remember when I pieced this together – 